What is modularity anyway? That's not as simple a question to answer as you may think. The plain fact of the matter is that modules are different things in different languages, and modularity means different things to different programmers. In this lesson, I'm going to try to pin down what modularity really means and why it's important. Modularity was a core idea in small talk, but to a large extent, the idea has been changed or watered down by many modern languages. Some modern languages have module classes or keywords, which in spite of their name don't always implement strict modularity. In Ruby, for example, a module can contain a whole mass of code that can be imported or mixed into quite unrelated classes, which is pretty much the opposite of what I mean by modularity. As in previous lessons in this series, I'm using the Smalltalk V tutorial as the core text. If you haven't got a copy, use the link below to get one. In the last lesson, we came to this passage on page 14 of the tutorial. Information hiding, as this encapsulation of code and data is known in computer science, makes for highly portable, easily modifiable and safe software. Encapsulation is the object-oriented version of modularity, as Adele Goldberg, one of the developers of Smalltalk 80, clearly states in the book Smalltalk 80, the language and its implementation, objects support modularity. The functioning of any object does not depend on the internal details of other objects. But there's more to encapsulation and modularity than just information hiding. Information hiding can mean little more than protecting the fields of an object, its internal variables, from outside manipulation. In small talk, that's done automatically since all instance variables, the variables that belong to individual objects, are private. In other object-oriented languages, such as Java and c -sharp, data hiding is more of an optional feature. You can make variables public, which means that they are not hidden from other code, or you can make them private so that they are hidden and can only be accessed by using public methods, which is a bit more modular. But modularity, real modularity, is more than just protecting an object's data. You also need to protect its implementation details. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's go back to Adele Goldberg. Remember that, as I explained in previous lessons, Smalltalk objects communicate by sending messages, that's requests, to other objects. An object provides methods to respond to those messages. This is what Adele Goldberg says. A crucial property of messages is that they are the only way to invoke an object's operations. These properties ensure that the implementation of one object cannot depend on the internal details of other objects only on the messages to which they respond. Messages ensure the modularity of the system because they specify the type of operation desired, but not how that operation should be accomplished. Now that last sentence is the important one. Messages ensure the modularity of the system because they specify the type of operation desired, but not how that operation should be accomplished. The operation is accomplished by the code of a method. So what Adele Goldberg means here is that not only is data protected, but so too is code. The code of the method, how that method actually works, is the sole responsibility of the programmer who wrote that method. When I use an object whose code was written by someone else, I don't need to know anything about how that object's methods are implemented. As far as I am concerned, the object is a self-contained unit that accepts requests and returns replies. That's all I need to know about it. It's a sort of software black box with one or more microphones into which I can make requests and one or more delivery funnels through which it can deliver replies. From the outside, I don't know what's inside the box. I don't know how it works. All I know is that I can send it messages and it can respond to them. I ask it to do something it replies by sending me back some sort of data. I don't know what goes on inside the box, and it's none of my business. By great good luck, I happen to have this black box here, so I can try this out. I've got this one interface, this microphone. This is how I issue my requests. So I send it a message, 
Give me some chocolate. And I hope it has a method of dealing with that request. If so, yes, one bar of chocolate. Hurrah! An important feature of modularity is that the programmer who wrote the class that defines the object that I am using can go back and change everything inside that class. Literally everything, including both its data and the code of its methods. And as long as the ways in and the ways out remain the same, those changes should not affect my code. They should not break my code. They should not have unexpected side effects on my code. Adele Goldberg gives the example of a dictionary object, a set of key-value pairs, where a key such as the integer 30 is associated with a string value such as the name Dave. So you can pass an integer to a dictionary as a message, and, all being well, the dictionary will send back the value associated with it, for example, the name Dave. Now, Goldberg says, Although a curious programmer may want to know how associations are represented in a dictionary, this internal implementation information is unnecessary for successful use of a dictionary. Knowledge of a dictionary's implementation is of interest only to the programmer who works on the definition of the dictionary object itself. A similar emphasis on modularity, though the very different implementation, was described by Niklaus Wirt. He created the Pascal language and then he created the Modular 2 language, which, as you might guess from its name, was very big on modules. Modular 2 is not an object-oriented language. It doesn't have messages and methods in the same way as Smalltalk, but it does have interfaces, which, just like methods, restrict access to the data and code inside a module. Viet designed Modular 2 to be a systems programming language with a high degree of reliability. He described modules as having well-specified interfaces that can be declared independently of their actual implementation, which, in principle, is very similar to the object-oriented idea of black box encapsulation. So, in a nutshell, that's what I mean when I talk about modularity. I mean that each object has interfaces for communication. In small talk, messages are passed and they're received by the methods of an object. If you're writing code in a modern object-oriented language such as Java, C-sharp, Ruby or object Pascal, you may want to think carefully about how you can implement rigorous modularity. Now, there are in fact some subtle and not always obvious ways in which modularity can be broken even if you have private variables and public accessor methods. For example, you may write class B that descends from class A. The author of class A may declare some public variables, and if your class inherits those, its modularity would be compromised. Another way in which modularity can be, in effect, bypassed is by sending by-reference arguments to a method and using changes to those arguments instead of using the value returned by the method. That means that if the author of that method changes the implementation, your code may break as a result. The return value may be correct, but your code ignores that return value and uses the value of the argument instead. So the implementation details, which should have been private, are in effect exposed to the world beyond the object. Let me show you an example. Here is some C-sharp code. It has this class, my class, uh, with the method getBonus that you can see here. Now, this method takes an amount of money, some sort of investment, as an argument, and it calculates what that money has earned, that is, the interest due on it, and it returns the sum of the investment, including the interest. Now, I have two buttons. You can see that up here. I've got two buttons on my form both of which, uh, when they're clicked, call this method and pass to it a value of 100. The interest rate, you can see down here, that's 0 0.2. So the value that I expect to be returned should be 120 from both these buttons that call the method. So let's try it out. Click first button one, then button two. Yep everything works as expected. 
But now the author of my class decides to rewrite the code of the get bonus method. So here's the code of the new method. It's got the same name, it takes the same argument, and it also returns the same type of data. So I'd expect it to continue working as before. But this time the value of the argument num is not changed inside the method. Look, I've kept the old method commented out down here so you can compare it. So in the old method, the actual value of the argument num was changed. But in the new method, the payment due variable, which is local to that method, is the one that's changed. And its value is what is returned. So let me try this out again. So button one and button two continue to use exactly the same code as they used previously, sending the same data and expecting the same sort of result back. When I click button one, that's fine. 120, correct result. Click button two. Ah, there's a problem. So button two shows an incorrect value. Why is that? Let's look back at the code. It's because button one, if I go up here, you can see that button one uses the value returned from the get bonus method, whereas button two has decided to use the value of the argument itself. It's hung on to the value of the variable that it sent as a by reference argument. So it's the value of the investment variable here that is actually changed. This is fine at the outset with the first version of the method, but when the author of my class changed the implementation of get bonus, and you can see that's here. So when that was changed, the code stopped working as expected because instead of using the well-defined input and output channels to the object, that is sending a message in small talk terms to the method and waiting for a reply back from it, button two decided to use the by reference argument, which is in effect a pointer. And so that means that the code of the button to underscore click method depends on the actual implementation details of the get bonus method. And that's not a good thing to do because it breaks modularity. This video has been a bit different from most of my other videos. It's been more of a discussion of an idea rather than a technique showing you how to write some particular piece of code. Even so, I hope it's given you something to think about. As I said at the start, there is no one clear definition of modularity. Modules mean different things in different languages and different things to different programmers. But when I talk about modularity, I mean a style of programming in which the internal details of an object, both its data and its code, are sealed off from the code outside that object. And to communicate with an object, you have to use precisely defined ways into and out of that object. In some languages, those ways in and out may be declared as interfaces. In an object-oriented language like Smalltalk, the interfaces to an object are provided by methods that respond to messages. Now, I hope you've enjoyed this lesson and remember to bookmark the playlist so that you can follow this series in order and subscribe to my channel and click that bell so that you'll be notified whenever I upload new lessons.